All right. If you have any more to say, put it in a book. <laughs> oh, good to see everybody. Happy, happy Easter. Happy Resurrection Day. This is, uh, this is a highlight. This day is really all about Jesus. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We'll be in several places this morning. Uh, in fact, I'll apologize in advance. There's going to be a lot of passages we may, uh, just for time's sake, we may uh, um, skip on a little bit as we move on. But this day is all about Jesus. I don't know where you are with Christ today as you come to church. I hope that you know him as your Savior. I hope that, that Jesus means everything to you because he rose, because he died for us and he rose. Now, there's a lot of views about Jesus that are running, uh, and if you just met anyone on the street today and you did a quick survey, who is Jesus, these maybe are some of the answers that you would get. Well, you might get Jesus was a very good man. He was uh, perhaps the epitome of mankind, the, the best ever. You might get that Jesus was kind of a revolutionary. If they're kind of scholarly, they might say that because that's very much in vogue along scholarly circles. You might get someone who says Jesus was very wise. He was a wise man. You might get someone who would say, well, he's an inspiration to all of us for the way he lived his life and for the way he died. You might hear someone say that he was a prophet. He was a Jewish prophet. You might hear somebody say that, um, that he was a spiritual man, a sage in that way. You would probably get very few who would truly hit the mark and say, Jesus is Savior. Probably not as many. And the reason for that, I believe, is because you have to believe certain things about Jesus in order to call him that. Now, when he was introduced to the world by the angel before he was born, how was he introduced, class? Unto you was born this day in the city of David, a eh? Savior. Savior. Jesus' own self-identity, his his self-description of what he came to do. He says, the Son of Man did not come to be served. By the way, that Son of Man is a loaded term. Go back to Daniel chapter um, 9, I think. It, it, or is it 7? Daniel chapter 7. It, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom. ransom. What's a ransom? That's a payment, Right? It's a payment for somebody. To, if, if somebody's kidnapped, you pay a ransom and you get them back. So Jesus used all of those words to describe himself and to describe his mission. And none of them were so that, well, I just want people to hold me in high esteem when I'm gone. All right? He understood himself to be Savior. Robert Stein, who is a um, teacher at Southern Baptist Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky, writes this. It says, without the openness to the supernatural, the result of any investigation of the life of Christ has predetermined that the resulting Jesus will be radically different from the Jesus who is described in Scripture, who was born of a virgin, anointed by the Spirit, who healed the sick, who raised the dead, who died for the sins of the world, who rose from the dead and ascended into heaven. Yet it is this supernatural Jesus that humanity desperately needs. For only this supernatural Jesus can bridge the gap between human sin and God's holiness. What the world so critically needs, besides love, sweet love, <laughs> is a Savior. We need a Savior. Why? Because we can't do the love, sweet love so good. Can we? Human history is pretty clear evidence of that. So he says in writing his work about Jesus, he has assumed the presence of the supernatural in the life of Jesus. In other words, this life of Christ has been written from a believer's viewpoint. And this sermon is delivered from the perspective of a believer's viewpoint. Somebody who has come to know Jesus as Savior and has been convinced beyond any reasonable doubt that he rose from the dead. In fact, this Easter is kind of part of my own story. It's part of my own spiritual journey uh, as, as a young man. When I was in college, uh, I was a freshman at Cypress College <laughs> so long ago before I, before I transferred, went to Biola. I was in a philosophy class, and I had my faith challenged in that class. The teacher was, was great. Students were great. But there was one guy in there who was a really on-fire Christian, 
and he was trying to convert everybody, and frankly, I didn't like the way he was trying to do it. I was a little embarrassed, frankly, by it. And, and, but I had to admit, well, he's doing something. I'm just sitting here, you know, like a potted plant. I'm not saying anything. I'm not doing anything. So I had, I had to, even though I didn't like what he was doing, I had to admit to myself, well, what do I believe? And why do I believe it? Is it just because my family has always believed it, or is there something a little deeper going on here? And that led me uh, into about, really, the, it was intensely done over a period of about two months. It, it has not stopped since that point in my life to, to look about and to study the resurrection of Jesus, because I reasoned in my mind, if that's true, if the resurrection really happened, then the whole ball of wax makes sense. And frankly... It's always seemed strange to me, and please don't be offended if, <laughs> if this hits you a little bit, but it's always seemed strange to me that someone can say, I believe that Jesus died for my sins and he resurrected on the third day, and yet treat him as if he is only mildly important. I've never gotten that, because if that's true, is that not the most incredible thing that has ever happened? And if we truly believe it, would that not make a difference in how we live and who we're following? It, it, to me, I've never been a fan of religion for religion's sake, despite what I do. I do what I do because as an 18-year-old, I became firmly convinced that this is not a pipe dream, that this is not some made-up story that somebody wanted us to feel better about ourselves who told us that it actually happened. And so today we're going to look at it because we're going to look at what Paul wrote about it in 1 Corinthians 15, and we're going to move from there, and we're going to say why the resurrection is important, and then present some evidence. But first, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 9 is what we're going to read. This is our, our, where, where we're going to look in depth. We'll be all over the place before we're done this morning. So here we go. By the way, high school students, college students, I'm speaking especially to you today because I was your age when this stuff really began to sink, and I'm glad you're with us. I was your age when, when this made a, a, a true difference in my life. It was, there was never a time where, where I can remember not believing, but there definitely was a time when I remember saying, this is now mine, it is not just my parents, it is not just my older brothers who have led me down this path, this is mine now, I get it. And I hope this morning that this helps you a step at least in that direction as well. So here's what Paul wrote. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according, in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. All right, here's what the message is about this morning. This message is about the resurrection of Jesus and it's essential to the message of Christ, and the reality of it is supported by compelling evidence. That's what we're going to talk about. Why? What's the purpose? Frankly, the purpose is to persuade you if you're not persuaded already. To persuade you that Jesus died in your place for the forgiveness of your sins. And that his resurrection gives you a compelling reason to believe this and to live as his follower. So that's what I hope to accomplish by talking today. So here we go. First, we're going to talk about the importance of the resurrection. Why is it important? Well, it's important, first of all, because it is an essential. Now, that word essential is chosen for a reason. It is an essential. What's essential mean? Class? Must have. All right? You must. It must be there. It's not, oh, I, I'm going to choose for the resurrection. It's kind of a nice thing, so we'll include that, too. Right? It's essential. You can't take it away. If you do take it away, you no longer have the message of the good news. It's something else, but it's not the gospel as preached in the first century. 
It's an essential part of it. Here's what Paul says in verses 3 through 4 again, same passage. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. Now, how many know when Paul wrote this to, to the Corinthian church? He founded the church. Anybody know what year? In the 50s, okay? Jesus was crucified either in 30 or 32 A.D., so this happened about 20 to 25 years after the fact. So that's when Paul is writing this. This was not written 100 years after the fact by somebody else not named Paul. It was written by Paul about 25 years after it, after the, the events he's talking about. What Paul says here, what he writes, were not his words, most likely. What he writes here, and you notice he says, I delivered to you what I also received. He received these words. These words are part of a very early um, confession of the church. In other words, when the church would get together and wherever it was, they would probably repeat these words to one another. The church formed in Jewish circles. Jewish circles were, of course, um, pretty well educated. Gentile circles where Paul went, not so much. There's a lot of illiteracy. So they would teach by memory of some things. And this is one of those that many people, probably most or perhaps all, in the church committed to memory, and it happened very early after the resurrection of Jesus. In fact, scholars trace this to just months after Jesus ascended into heaven. This saying that Paul writes, it's incredibly early. And so Paul is passing this along to him, and right in the middle of it, or right at the end of it, is a declaration of what? That he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. That's why it's important. It's further, it's further evidence that the early declaration, when the apostles preached, they talked about the resurrection, and it was right in the middle of their message. Now, as we're going to see later, that is an incredible fact because they began preaching this message in the very same city where Jesus was crucified, Jerusalem. Forty days later, they started saying, this guy's alive. And they weren't saying, oh, he's alive, he's alive in spirit. and in spirit. They were saying he's really alive. That's what they were saying. Also, Paul said he received it. He didn't make it up. It was a message that, that uh, was not conceived by his own brilliance. He received it. Who did he receive it from? According to his words in Galatians chapter 1, he writes this, For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. Gospel means good news. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, again, if you're not so keen on the supernatural and Jesus, that's going to sound weird to you. But we have to explain somehow that Paul became who he became. And the only way I can explain a guy like Paul becoming who he became is that something really radical happened to him. He describes it, and it is described in the book of Acts. He was literally knocked out flat by the risen Jesus. He was changed. So at the heart of the message is that he was raised on the third day. If you take this away, you no longer have the gospel. Paul understood this, which leads it to the second reason why the resurrection is important. It's important because our faith is empty without it. Here's what he writes in verses 1 through 2, just before the passage we read. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you that you received in which you stand and by which you are being saved. A lot of verbs going on there, by the way. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. All right, so let's back up and break that down a little bit. Paul tells them that the gospel he preached to them, and that they received, and by which they are being saved, all those verbs, is something they stand upon. Now, if you've listened to me long enough, you know that verb tenses in the New Testament Greek are very important, right? It's exciting stuff. You all go home after you hear this. When Charles or I preach, you think, wow, I'm so glad they explained the Greek perfect tense to me this morning. I am real. My heart's warmed by that sort of information. And just because I know you love it so much, let me give you a couple. The verbs preached and received are in the Greek aorist tense. Woo, 
which is a tense of action taking place at a specific time, usually in the past, but it can actually be. In the, it's, the focus is on the action at that time. So Paul says, I preached and you received. There was a point in time where you received. You said yes, all right? By the way, the verb preached is really a form of the word gospel. We get the word evangelic or evangelize from it. It's the Greek word euangelion. Ooh. All right, so what he's saying, if we, if we translated that, the, the, it, it would be, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel which I gospelized to you. It doesn't sound so good in English. It made perfect sense in Greek, which you received. The verb stand is in the perfect tense. You're not wowed by that. <laughs> I expected a... Which is past action having continuing results. So at the time they received, yeah, they stood. <laughs> yeah, I needed that five minutes ago, right? Better late than never, though. All right. Now where was I? Standing, uh, past action, continuing results. The idea would be that they have taken their stand and that result would continue. Now, that, now that it's continuing on in their lives. The verb saved is the present tense which conveys cur uh, uh, continuous action. All right? Not looking at it as a one-time thing. It's continuous action. You put all that together and you have this really wonderful statement that Paul made. Complex statement, but wonderful. But what does the phrase, unless you believed in vain, mean? Because that's in there. He says, I preached this, you received it, now you stand on it. And if, of course, you're keeping, by the way, the word if could be since you are doing this. What's the phrase, unless you believed in vain, mean? Well, it means that unless they believe something that was worthless. He is going to now go into a very long chapter. He didn't write it as a chapter. It was just, you know, we broke it up in chapters. But he's going to write a very long part of the book of 1 Corinthians to talk about the resurrection. Everything that follows in 1 Corinthians 15 is about the resurrection. So he's just getting ready to say all of that he's going to say about it. And basically the understanding would be there that if their acceptance of the gospel does not include the resurrection, or if the resurrection doesn't happen, or, or it hasn't happened, it would be totally empty. The message would be worthless. Or to put a spin on words, without an empty tomb, we have an empty message. And that's what he was saying. Then he states it more clearly in verses 16 through 19. He says this, For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. Even in English that comes across pretty well, doesn't it? Your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life, we are of all people to be most pitied. Again, just break down. The word futile means fruitless or worthless. Your faith is worthless. Go home. Go do whatever you're going to do on Easter, but don't be here because it's pointless without the resurrection. That's what he's saying. If no resurrection, it means your sins are still on you. If no resurrection, then those who have died thinking that they were going to be alive again in Jesus got a horrible realization the moment they died. Without a resurrection, anyone who has trusted Christ, Paul says, is pitiable. You poor person, you poor misguided fool, would be the way to put it. What Paul is also hinting at here is that without the resurrection, all of the self-denial and inconvenient moral virtues that we hold as believing in Christ are also worthless. Why? <laughs> if, if Christ isn't alive, ever, the, whole, the whole message is pointless. Eat, drink, and be merry, like the guy in Luke said. Because tomorrow we die. Frankly, that's the only philosophy that makes sense if none of this is real, in my opinion. It, it really is. Dostoevsky, the great Russian writer, put it this way, without God, all things are permitted. What he meant by that is without God, without, without the supernatural, without the forgiveness of sins, without all of that, it is very difficult for you to establish a basis for morality. You can be moral, 
but there's no foundation undergirding it other than I think this is the way we should act. And if somebody else thinks they should act differently, who are you to say they shouldn't? Who are you? If there's a God, he can say, but you, probably not. So that's what Paul is asserting as he writes this. So the reason we make such a big deal about the resurrection is that it's an essential part of our faith. You can't have Christian faith without it. You can try, but you really can't do it. And you cannot remove it and still have something that's meaningful. Again, go home. You're going to take me up on that in just a little bit, I know, <laughs> even though you believe in it. All right. So what's the evidence for it? If you're like me, you'd want to say, okay, Paul, that's great, but is there evidence for it? What's the evidence? Paul would tell you that, look, man, I got knocked out. That's my evidence. I saw him. All right. Is there other evidence we can point to? A method commonly used today to determine the historicity of an event is the inference to the best explanation. A great Christian apologist named William Lane Craig describes this as an approach where we begin with the evidence available to us and then we infer what would be true or, or what would, if true, provide the best explanation of that evidence. In other words, we ought to accept an event as historical if it gives the best explanation for the evidence surrounding it. As I read about the resurrection, I was a young man of 18. One of the things that impressed me was the fact that very few people talked about the fact that the, the first proclamation of the Christian message was done. I mean, I heard it growing up. <laughs> you know, it kind of went in one ear, picked up speed, went out the other ear. I believed it, but I never really thought about it. But what the book of Acts tells us is that 40 days after Jesus was crucified, his disciples, who had been scared and running for their lives, all of a sudden show up on the streets of Jerusalem preaching this message in known languages that were around them, which was kind of miraculous. And then when, when they were accused of being drunk, Peter stands up and, and gives the first sermon in history of the Christian church. And at, at, the, at, at the heart of that sermon, Peter talks about Jesus rising from the dead. Now he did this 40 days after the event where the very place Jesus buried was within walking distance. That's the amazing part. That's a fact that you have to explain if there's no res just one of them. So that's what, that's what Craig is talking about. So here's some that we can look at, and I'm going to go probably quicker than you'd like through these. And, and for those of you who are purists, want to see every passage of Scripture read that's going to be up here or on your notes, I'm about to disappoint you, all right? So don't freak out. You can read it. You can read them all later. But first of all, let's look at Old Testament Scripture. According to many scholars, there are 353 or so prophecies about Jesus from the Old Testament written before he was born. That's one of the amazing things about the Old Testament. In 1944, there was a paper published, Science Speaks, uh, Scientific Proof for the Accuracy of Prophecy in the Bible. A guy by the name of Stoner figured that the odds of one man fulfilling 48 of the prophecies was 1 in 10 to the 157th power. In other words, there's a whole bunch of zeros strung together in terms of the odds of one man fulfilling all the Old Testament prophecies that Jesus fulfilled. So the odds are astronomical. Astronomical. Here's one, and Isaiah 53 is, is the best in terms of a passage which is crystal clear. And, and as you read it, uh, especially in hindsight, now remembering that it was written 700 years before Jesus, or if you're a liberal scholar, 300 years before Jesus, but I go for the seven, but even if it's 300 years, it's still incredible. Here's, here's just some of what Isaiah writes. For he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole, and by his wounds we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own. Yet the Lord Yahweh laid on him the sins of us all. Then later on in the chapter, but he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. But it was Yahweh's good plan. Whenever the Lord is capitalized like that, it's the, the name Yahweh in, in Hebrew. But it was Yahweh's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. He will enjoy a long life, and the Lord's Yahweh's good plan will prosper in his hands. When he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous. 
for he will bear all their sins. I will give him the honors of a victorious soldier because he poured out his soul to death. He was counted among the rebels. He bore the sins of many and interceded for rebels. That's incredible, isn't it? 700 years before the fact. And that's one that the, the, the apostles go back to time and time again. Time and time again. Then there's one in Genesis 3.15 at, at the fall, Adam and Eve. And it says this, I will cause hostility, this is God speaking to, to the serpent now at this point, I will cause hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. Psalm 110.1, New Testament writers use this a lot. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. Now what's, who's talking to who here? That's the question. The Lord, the one that's written in all capitals, that's the Hebrew word Yahweh. The one written with some small letters, that's the Hebrew word Adonai. So you have Yahweh speaking to Adonai. Both words for God, by the way, in the Old Testament. So you have Yahweh speaking to Adonai, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies. Who's he talking to? Again, the New Testament, the apostles interpret that. I mean, he's talking to Jesus, his son who came, who died, and is now Lord. That's what they called him. Jesus is Lord, Adonai, as described there. There's a few others. They're written in your bulletin. Just look at them. The point is this. The point is this. Before Jesus was born, there are scriptures that point to his death and to his resurrection. You know, you notice from Isaiah, the guy who, who is being crushed and, and wounded and bruised and beaten ends up pretty good. <laughs> Going to have lots of descendants. Looks like he's still alive. So it was all there before he was even born. The next point of evidence, and this is going to seem strange to you, but it's the actual death of Jesus because there are those who don't buy the fact that Jesus actually died on the cross. Here's what Scripture says. Paul says this, 1 Corinthians 5, 3, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scripture. Mark, the Gospel writer, second Gospel writer, describes the cross incident in this way in chapter 15, verses 37 through 39, and then 43 through 35, through 45. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that this is the, that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. Now we jump forward, and we got this guy named Joseph of Arimathea who is mentioned nowhere in Scripture until here. Joseph of Arimathea took a risk <laughs> and went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Joseph was an honored member of the high council, and he was waiting for the kingdom of God to come. Pilate couldn't believe that Jesus was already dead. Usually crucifixion took a while longer. So he called for the Roman officer and asked if he had died yet. The officer confirmed that Jesus was dead, so Pilate told Joseph he could have the body. That's in, in the Gospel of Mark. Now it's worth noting out then in establishing this as is, is history that, that uh, the Roman soldiers were pretty good at crucifixion. I, I don't know of any time they made a mistake and said, oh, I guess he's, he's not dead yet. We've got to leave him here a little bit longer. Crucifixion was, was incredibly gruesome. Mel Gibson got it right, the way he described it, frankly, in, in the film. Whatever you think of Mel Gibson, he was right on in terms of how it was portrayed, what happened to Jesus, and what he went through. There, there was no recovering from that. And no serious scholar buys that anymore, by the way. We're going to see a little bit more of that later on. So he actually died. He was crucified. He died. Now, the next one, as evidence, again, is going to seem strange, but the actual burial of Christ is crucial to this. Why is it crucial? Well, because, again, we go back. Before you can have a resurrection, you have to have a real death. Before you have an empty tomb, you have to have a full tomb, right? And if you can't establish either the death or that there was a body in the tomb and exactly where the tomb was, then the resurrection could be a story people made up because there was no way to, no way to demonstrate that it was that tomb that became empty. So it's important to know that there was a grave that had a body in it named Jesus and to know where it was and to have good provenance for that, okay? Those antique fans among us. All right, here's what Paul says. He was buried. 
Now that seems strange to be part of a confessional, doesn't it? But it's right in there. He died for our sins according to Scripture. He was buried. Why didn't he just jump to the resurrection? But it's there in what the, the, the Christians quoted to one another. In Mark, 40, uh, the chapter 15, 46 through 47, it mentioned Joseph of Arimathea, right? And here's what it says later. And Joseph bought a linen shroud, and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud, and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of the rock, and he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he... Did I have the graves there? Did I miss those? No, I did. Did I miss the picture? Were there pictures that I missed? Later. All right, that's later. Okay. I forget where I have things. All right, here we go. Now, how do we know the burial is a real story? Maybe it's just made up. Well, there's a couple of things happening here. First of all, this guy, Joseph of Arimathea, mentioned nowhere else in the Gospels. Mark describes him, the other Gospel writers describe him as a member of the Sanhedrin. What was the Sanhedrin class? The Sanhedrin was a, was a mix of Jewish leaders made up of Pharisees, Sadducees, and some political rulers. All right, Pharisees and Sadducees really didn't like each other that much. Pharisees were supernaturalists, Sadducees were not, they were all Jewish, and then other, other leaders. Joseph of Arimathea was a member of that council. Now, what do you know about that council concerning the crucifixion of Jesus? They were the ones that condemned him, sent him to Pilate. These were not friends of Jesus overall. And now you have, popping up in the gospel narrative, this guy named Joseph of Arimathea seemingly coming out of nowhere. Now again, if I were making this up, and I was a guy writing in the first century, I wanted to make the story look good, and I wanted to, to give it all the credence in the world, I, I would not have had a Jewish leader doing this because they were kind of enemies of Jesus. I would have had Peter being really brave and going and getting Jesus' body and burying him someplace so that everybody knew. Or some other follower of Jesus. Why him? The other reason why Joseph of Arimathea is likely a person who really existed is because there is no indication that any Jewish leader or anybody else took issue with this in the first century. Saying, hey, wait a minute. That's our guy. He didn't do that. So Joseph of Arimathea most likely, I, I have no problem with it, but if you're, a, if you're a skeptic, most likely is real. It would be an awful lot of explanation if he wasn't. And there are no other competing stories about how Jesus was buried by Christians or anyone else. And again, if you're in the scholarly world today, they accept this. It, even if they don't believe in the supernatural, they accept that Joseph of Arimathea put Jesus in his grave because there's just too much evidence for it in the textual accounts. All right, so that's important. That means that they knew where he was buried. All right, that, that later on there was no mistaking that. Everybody knew where it was. It was close to where the crucifixion took place. Okay, now the actual empty tomb and that it was discovered by women. All right, so the act, that's a picture. Go on to the next one. I, I, went, I had the great honor of going to Israel five years ago and, and driving along Route 6953 from Megiddo uh, towards the Sea of Galilee, all of a sudden you come upon this. And by the way, in Jerusalem and other places, these are kind of all over the place. The way the Jews buried themselves, if I can say it, put it that way, in the first century and beyond is they, they would put the body in a grave wrapped up. By the way, I've become a semi-expert on the Shroud of Turin, but we don't have time to get into it. 3D imaging and all of that. But anyway, they would wrap them up in a shroud, put them in the grave, a year later, go back, get the bones, put them in a box called an ossuary. And then they would use the slab of stone for the next person that died. All right, So that's how they did it. And so these are all over the place. And that's just to show you that when, the, when Scripture describes a very large stone, these, their very large stones are still there. And, and you can see them in various places throughout Israel. So I just wanted to show you, and, and I was in a group, so we're all looking at, there are actually three entrances uh, to this burial chamber. So there's people looking at it. And then one young lady decided, well, I want to see what it's like being in there. So she went in, took her picture. All right, so those, those things exist. All right, so Paul writes this, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. And then Mark describes in Mark chapter 15, verses 2 through 8, describes 
the women going to the tomb, they're worried about how they're going to get the rock out of there, and they encounter, they encounter a young man who says, he's not here, he's risen. All right? And then in Matthew, Matthew chapter 28, I will read this one, verses 11 through 15. As the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and told the leading priests what had happened. A meeting with the elders was called, and they decided to give the soldiers a large bribe. They told the soldiers, you must say Jesus' disciples came during the night while we were sleeping, and they stole his body. If the governor hears about it, we'll stand up for you so you won't get in trouble. So the guards accepted the bribe and said what they were told to say. Their story spread widely among the Jews, and they still tell it today. And in fact, in the first century, you have Jewish writers, second century also, explaining the empty tomb. They assume the tomb is empty, which is interesting. They explain it by saying the disciples came and stole the body. That's, that's in, in sources other than the Gospels. Now, why is that important? Why do we put it out? It's important that women discover the body or discover the tomb empty because that is an inconvenient truth of the facts. Because if you're writing to make this up and you want the things to look good and you're a first century Jewish person, the last people you're going to have discovering the body and be believed as women. Unfortunately, they were unenlightened in their view of women and their testimony in the first century. Women were not even allowed to testify in court as men were. That's how doubtful. So to say, and all the gospel writers say the women went and discovered it, is not doing your, your story a favor. It's actually leading to incredulity with your story for people. Who the only reason to include it is because that's the way it went down. Secondly, secondly, the fact that the enemies of Jesus, who in this case were the Jewish leaders, presupposed an empty tomb by the story that, that went around. In other words, the disciples stole the body. That was their explanation for the empty tomb. They knew it was empty. They had to explain it. They couldn't go to it and say, he's here. So they had to explain it somehow, and that's how they explained it. By the way, I'm not sure the guards were Roman. I think there was a Roman seal on the tomb. But from what's described here, the Jewish people also had a guard who took care of the temple area. And these guys go directly to the chief priests. I don't think Roman soldiers would have done that. I think Roman soldiers would have just skedaddled. There would have been no hope for them if they had allowed this to happen. They, they, they would not have gone to Pilate or anyone else because it would be instant death. These Jewish guards, however, go to the Sanhedrin. Say, we can't find him. <laughs> All right, we'll say yeah, their worst nightmare was happening to them. And, and I don't think we, we get that. So it leaves us to determine what's the best explanation for the empty tomb. The tomb is empty. All, again, this is something... Believing scholars, non-believing scholars all believe the tomb is empty. All right? So how do, you, how do you explain it? There's been all kinds of theories, not many of them all that good. One is that, of course, the disciples stole the body as the, as the Jewish leaders passed on. In 1965, a guy by the name of Dr. Hugh Schoenfeld wrote a book called The Passover Plot. And in this book, he theorized that Jesus did not really rise from the dead, but repeated the argument that the disciples came and stole the bodies. This is amazing, again, assuming the disciples who were pretty much down and out there had to go overcome, whether it's Roman guards or Jewish guards, there were more of those than there were the disciples. The disciples, that they came and broke the Roman seal, that they rolled the stone back, that they removed the grave clothes from the body and left them there. And they folded the headpiece by itself, again, if the gospel accounts are, are true. And then they took the body. While no one woke up and no one caught them, and every disciple died for knowing something was not true. Because they all died, eventually, for something that they knew to be false, if that's the way it happened. Another explanation was that the women went to the wrong tomb. That is, uh, other than being sexist, it's unlikely. Because again... If you can establish Joseph Arimathea, everybody knew where the grave was, the women especially. I don't know about you, but women are a lot better at this than I am. There's no way, if I understand women, that they were going to mistake the Savior they loved and where he'd been buried. It just, it just 
doesn't make sense. Another one is that Jesus didn't really die. He just looked dead. Not quite dead yet. He swooned. And then was able to get out of the grave somehow and convince his disciples that he was resurrected. Now, a more inventive theory, and, and I actually saw this. That again, one of my, one of my um, um, heroes is Dr. William Lane Craig. He's a great, he's a, a Christian apologist. And he had a debate with a guy named Dr. Uh, Robert Cavan. He's a UCI professor. And again, they were talking about the empty grave, and the UCI professor was saying, yeah, I agree, the grave was empty. Then how do you... By the way, this is very tough if you, if you are a scholar, because you have to explain it. This guy's theory, and it goes back to, uh, to the Gnostic Gospels, this guy's theory is that Jesus had a twin brother. <laughs> now, he's, he's saying it with a straight face, and he's very smart. All right? Now, he is. Jesus had a twin brother who was able to, when, 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 when Jesus died, he was able to get his body, and now he posed as Jesus to his disciples, convinced them he had been alive. Started what we know as Christianity. Now, what, what somebody like, like that will say to you, yes, it is unlikely, but a resurrection is more unlikely. And, that, and, and then it becomes kind of an argument, Right? But the best evidence in all the written documents of the period talk about resurrection. Yes, we as Christians understand resurrection doesn't happen. <laughs> we know people don't rise from the dead. That's what makes this so incredible. That's what makes it miraculous. So all of the alternative theories, you can see why the empty tomb is a very strong argument for the resurrection because virtually everyone accepts that it was empty. And if you accept that, now you have to explain it. All right. Eyewitness accounts, Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians 15. And that he appeared to Cephas. Who's Cephas? Peter, all right? This is his, his, his real name, his, his Hebrew name, Kepha. Cephas, that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also, for I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. And let's just stop there for a second. And, and, and this is Paul. Now, Paul is writing before Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They probably wrote maybe a, 10 years later, maybe five years later. Certainly they wrote before 70 A.D. because what happened in 70 A.D.? To Jerusalem? <laughs> it got wiped out. And if you're writing a Jewish account, you're probably going to mention that very important event, and nowhere is it in the Gospels. It's predicted by Jesus, but nowhere is it described. So the Gospels were written before 70 AD. Paul wrote before the Gospel writers. And he wrote independent of the Gospel writers. So now you have Paul saying the same thing the Gospel writers are saying about Jesus. Paul is important. A lot of people overlook the importance of what he said about the resurrection. And he's talking about the fact Jesus appeared to people afterwards. And he starts, he starts with Peter, or Simon, or his Hebrew name, Kepha, which is rock. Peter is where we get the word Peter from. Why would he start with Peter? Peter this denied Peter denied him. Peter, Peter, but what Judas did and Peter did, there's not a lot of difference, is there? Except Judas did it premeditated. But Peter totally disowned Jesus. And we have that beautiful account in John 21 where Jesus confronts Peter and asks him three times if he loves him. And there's, there's a lot behind that story, but he mentions Peter first. I, Paul was really brilliant in mentioning that. And he says, then to the 12, in other words, the rest of the apostles, and then to more than 500 brothers at one time. Basically, this is Paul's way of saying, you know what? There's a lot more that have seen him. 500, some of them have died since, but frankly, most of them are still alive. Go checking out with them. They saw him too. Then he appeared to James. Who's James? All right, this is not the James the disciple. This is James who wrote the epistle of James, the brother of Jesus. And Jude, by the way, is the other brother of Jesus. I'm sorry if you believe in the perpetual virginity of Mary here, all right? <laughs> Evidence is that she had other kids, James and Jude. Because we have the passage in Mark, Jesus' brothers and sisters were there, and he said... These people are my brothers. All right, so James was Jesus' brother, 
And, all, and we don't hear anything about him in the Gospels. We hear a lot about him in the book of Acts. Why? I don't know about you and how you do with siblings, but if your brother was Jesus, you might not like him that much either. And apparently during the life of Jesus, James and Jude were not true believers. They did not follow him. They were not his disciples. You probably would be, I'm not going to follow my brother around. Who does he think he is? Anyway, God. <laughs> I, had a, I had a couple of brothers who thought that. Jesus really was, though, so it's a big difference. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, without explanation if there's no resurrection, James becomes prominent in the book of Acts. All of a sudden, he's the guy, not Peter, leading the church in Jerusalem. It's incredible. What happened to James? This is what happened to James. His brother went to him, said, hi. By the way... I'm alive. Yes, I can see that. I would have loved to have been there. And then Paul says, last of all, is the one untimely he appeared to me. In other words, Paul says, I saw him. I saw him. And it changed his life. The book of Acts, Luke writing in Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, says this. He presented, speaking of Jesus, presented himself alive to them after his sufferings, by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom. Ed, Ed Sanders, a, a professor at Duke, does not believe in a literal resurrection of Jesus, but he says this, the following is an historical fact. The earliest disciples saw the risen Jesus. I don't know how they saw him, but they saw him. In other words, the evidence compels us to say something happened to these guys that was very real, to them at least, and it changed their lives. Final evidence for the resurrection, we'll go quick, the evidence of personal experience. Paul, in the book of Acts, describes, first of all, Luke describes his encounter with Jesus, and then Paul describes it twice in the book of Acts later on when he's talking to other people. This appears in Acts chapter 26, when he's talking to King Agrippa. And he, said, and he was under arrest, as he was very much in the book of Acts. He says this, At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, that shone around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, that's pretty good detail, right? In the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's hard for you to kick against the goads. And I explained that when we were in Acts chapter 26. If you didn't catch that sermon, too bad. And I said, who are you, Lord? Or who are you, sir, would be a better way to... And the Lord said, I am Jesus, who you are persecuting. Okay. Without the resurrection appearance of Jesus to Paul, it's very difficult to explain how Paul became the most influential Christian in the first century. I would have predicted Peter or someone else, but it was Paul. A guy who was very Jewish and yet took this thing to the Gentile world. Without this experience, it's very difficult to explain how that transformation happened because Paul was a hard guy, determined to snuff out Christianity determined. He meant it. And he was stopped on the way. The fact that you and I are here today is in itself miraculous. And let me just close with this as the band comes up. As far as personal experience is concerned, I believe in the resurrection of Jesus because I've had encounters with God that are unmistakable, encounters with Jesus that are unmistakable in my life. Times when I've known for sure he's there, that when I prayed there was somebody tugging on the other end of the rope. But here's what I've also seen throughout, and by the way, this is my 29th Easter in this area. I am getting old. As pastors, you know, you understand we only work one day a week, therefore we have a lot of time to goof off. And... In my goofing off times, I have been, I have been to homes of people who have, who have just suffered a loss. 
I, I've been at one, at one time at a home of a family who lost their mother and wife through suicide. We, we get called, by the nature of what we do, we get called to some pretty tense situations where people are, are really messed up. And what can you say? I mean, the, the, in a sense, the job is to bring the presence of Christ in there. Christ is already there before I get there, before Charles or anyone else gets there. But very often it helps, and I've, I've experienced, and there's a qualitative difference, and I, I can't explain it, but I can tell you I've experienced it. A qualitative difference between family and loved ones who have experienced a death, and they know Jesus, and they know that the person who has just died knows Jesus, as opposed to those who don't. Um, Paul describes it this way in, in 1 Thessalonians. He says, He's telling the church there, look, some of you have died. They ask him, Paul, some of our people have died. What happens? And he wrote, I don't want you to be uninformed about those who have, and he uses the term fallen asleep, about those who have fallen asleep. I don't want you to sorrow like those who don't have any hope. And then he, then he, gives, he gives this incredible description of the return of Christ. And he says that therefore comfort each other with these words and I've seen that in action there's a big difference and I can only attribute it to something real that is going on behind the scenes that I can only get a glimpse of right now but someday and the curtain will be back and we'll see it all see it all because of what Jesus did for us and I appeal to you this morning, if you have not yet tasted that in your life, if you don't, if you haven't stepped over the line, if you haven't said to Jesus, well, it's your way, not mine. I believe, I believe that you did die for me, my sins. I am guilty. You died for that. And I do want to now receive you and walk with you. I want to be called, I want to be numbered among your followers. Now I'll go back to what I said at the beginning. If this is true, which I have become convinced, in fact, if you can convince me it's not, I'll stop doing this tomorrow. I will, because it will make no sense. If it's true, and you believe that Jesus died and he rose, that is not something, is it? of just mild interest. Does it not mean everything? Does it not mean that Jesus is the most valuable person who ever lived and the most worthy of me to give my life to? If it doesn't mean that, I don't know what it means. I would love it if you would like to talk to me after the service today. Even if you want to come forward while the band plays, I'd be happy to pray with you, talk to you. If this is a step you need to take in your life, by all means, take it and take it today. Let's pray. Father in heaven, who sent your son, who willingly came, who now is at your right hand praying for us, who, who exercised incredible self-restraint to allow himself to be crucified, on our behalf for our sins is the way scripture describes it in place of us we thank you for that and I pray that each person here believes that and we thank you that you proved that that was true by rising from the dead and so Lord Jesus we want to tell you today that you are worth everything Help us to mean it from our heart and to act like it every day of our lives. We pray this in your name. Amen. We're going to, ushers will come forward for the offering in just a little bit. If you're visiting with us, just please be our guest today. We're going to continue our worship for a little bit, and then we'll be closing the service. Thank you for coming. God bless you. Let's enjoy this time of worship.